Yes, there is a lot of activity happening right now in our church, and there are a lot of things that are coming up, and we do covet your prayers for safe travels as we go uh, over the next few days, and just uh, in case you are a little unfamiliar uh, with the way our convention of churches works, uh, we are an autonomous church, meaning we are self-governed. No one else, uh, I don't get an email or a letter that says, hey, you got to be preaching on this, or you're not allowed to say these kinds of things. Is that the way it works? We are in voluntary cooperation with other churches from around the United States, and really even around the world, to send the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth, reaching our own Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then every place around this earth, that Jesus Christ has called us to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And here's the good thing, that even during times when there are troubles and when there are issues, when there are things going on that we don't always understand or there are things that are not good happening, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Amen. Sometimes when we can't necessarily see how God is going to get glory or how the name of Christ is going to be magnified, because there has been in various churches, cooperating churches, there have been things that have gone on, and there have been pastors that have done things that mock and deny the name of Jesus Christ and are completely ungodly. And there have been things that have happened to try to cover up that ungodly, horrific, evil behavior. But I thank God that even though there are some that have done that, the vast majority of the churches and the vast majority of people that we cooperate with in order to see the name of Christ go forward and be magnified are standing up and with a resounding voice saying, no more. No more. Can't happen. This is the first time that I'm actually going to be going to the National Convention, and it was because of some of these kinds of issues that have gone on that I felt compelled to go and stand with my brothers and sisters in Christ and say, no more. We cannot stand idly by and let people, women, children, be abused and covered up. No more. That is not how Jesus would act. That is not what our Savior would do. No more. And so, while that and even many of the other issues, and I talked about this a little bit last week with some of the culture war that has come to the United States of America and how the culture war has come to the feet of the church and Christianity and how it's no longer just a, okay, hey, we can agree to disagree on various things. No, if you are against various social justice movements that uh, people say need to happen, then you are not, you, you do not, ha you should not have a voice any longer. And unfortunately, some of this has begun to infiltrate various churches and some of the seminaries that we would support. And I want to stand with my brothers and sisters in Christ and say, no. We are here about the gospel of Jesus Christ who levels the playing field. We all come to Christ in the same manner. No matter what skin color you have, no matter what country you were born in, no matter how much money you have, we are all sinners in need of a Savior. We all need grace, the same grace of Jesus Christ. And when wrongs have happened, we should ask for forgiveness. And then as Christians, when forgiveness is asked, we're going to see this next Sunday in Jesus' radical teachings of radical forgiveness. We don't hold it over people's heads for the next 10, 20, 50, 100, 200, 1,000 years. 
I'm going to hold on to this grudge forever. And I'm a bigger victim than you were, and so I have the right to shout at you and all these kids. No, that does not belong in the church of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness. Repentance. Life transformation is what the church is supposed to be about. Radical transformation. So, as we come to the scriptures today, let's pray this together from Psalm 86 as a way of focusing in our hearts and our minds. There's so much in the world that can distract us, but I really hope that as we were singing that last song, Speak, O Lord, that that really is a prayer of our hearts. Speak, O Lord, the, these truths that are unchanged from the dawn of time. May they change me today. May they transform me today. Teach me your way, Lord, so that way I can love you and glorify you more. Let's pray this together. Ready and begin. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart, I will glorify your name forever, for great is your love toward me. Give me an undivided heart. I don't want to have some heart in the world and some heart with you, Jesus. Give me an undivided heart. And that is really the prayer of our hearts as we come to Luke chapter 6 today. And I saw the kids start to stand up. Yes, you are dismissed to go to the junior church. I changed my script a little bit, and everybody was, oh, man, ready to go. <laughs> Luke chapter 6 is where we are as we continue our verse-by-verse -verse study going through the gospel of Luke, looking at our Savior Jesus Christ and his life. And now he has begun what is known as the Sermon on the Plain, a, a sermon on this flattened area. The name of Jesus has begun to go out. His miracles have been seen. People are gathering and last week he gave some radical blessings, things that people wouldn't expect. What do you mean I'm blessed if I'm poor in spirit? I want to be rich. What do you mean I'm blessed if I hunger and thirst? Well, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. But then, after these radical blessings, today he wants to teach us about some radical love. A love that is not the world's definition of love. I get this kind, of, this kind of soft feeling inside of me when I see that person. I get a warm feeling. It's awesome. I'm saying those kind of things are wrong. But when the Bible talks about love, the agape is the Greek word for it, the unconditional sacrificial, conscious choice love that God has showed for us. It's more about action than feeling. It's often been said that love is, is different than many emotions. I get angry and so I lash out. I feel sad so I retreat. Well, biblical love is actually the other way around. If I do the action, the feeling of love will follow. If I treat people like I love them, then eventually, I tell you this, it's amazing. Even people that you thought, ah, I just can't stand that person, treat them like you would your closest friend, a brother and sister, because after all, as Christians, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, our Savior. The feeling will follow. Not saying you're going to agree on everything, but the radical love that Jesus is talking about is an action, not a feeling. So after these radical blessings, beginning in verse 24 of Luke 6, But woe to you who are rich, you have received your consolation, 
Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And woe to you when all men speak well of you, for so do their fathers to the false prophets. I got to kind of finish up. I didn't hit this particular passage last week. I meant to go all the way through this, but he's trying to contrast and saying those people that you think, oh, they've got everything in this life. They've got it all together. Man, I wish I could be more like that person. They're the people that have this veneer of seeming like they have it all together, but if you don't have Christ, if you do not have your eternal soul firmly rooted in the good news that Jesus has forgiven you, all the trappings of this world mean nothing. All the things that you can have, all the comfort of this life. What shall it profit you? You have everything in this world, yet you lose your own soul. Jesus was trying to contrast it here and say, maybe you're going to have things in this life, maybe you won't. But do not neglect your soul. Do not neglect the most important decision that you need to make in this life. I tell you this, if you're in here today and you do not know, I mean know, that Jesus Christ has forgiven you, if you have never asked him to forgive you of your sins, make that decision today. Let's get that settled so that you can know you're one of his children. You can know that you're secure. You can know what true joy and peace are all about. So after talking about these rich people who were kind of the, the uh, antithesis of many of the poor who would hate them and would be envious of what they would have, Jesus says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, in verse 27. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. And pray for those who who spitefully use you. Now, wait a second, Jesus. Let me clear out my ears here for a second. Say that for me again. I am supposed to hate my enemies, right? I'm supposed to curse those who curse me. I'm supposed to find out any way that I can to do evil unto those that hate me. And sure, I'll pray for those who spitefully use me, but it's going to be the what they call imprecatory prayers of the imprecatory psalms, where it's like, Lord, let your fiery arrows rain down upon my enemies. <laughs> yes, that's how I'll pray for my enemies. Now, that's why this is radical. That's why this was different. This is not what the people were expecting Jesus to say. He said, I'm telling you, those who hear, hearing when Jesus talks about this is not just an auditory response. It's the auditory response comes into my head and now I'm going to allow it to change me and I'm going to obey what is said. I'm not just hear, listening in that sense. I'm not just letting it affect my eardrum. Nope, it's affecting my life. I will now obey. So I say to those who are ready to hear and obey, unconditionally, sacrificially, with a conscious choice, love your enemies. This is radical for our world in the 21st century right now. No, somebody's on the other side of the political aisle from me. They are the enemy and they need to be taken out. I need to shout as loud as I can because they shouldn't have a voice. You are an evil person doing evil things. 
you need to be stopped at all costs. It concerns me when political rhetoric and the desire for certain things to, to happen now becomes justification for assassination, murder. I was deeply troubled this last week to learn that, you know, I praise God it was thwarted, but that one of our Supreme Court justices, there was somebody that said, I, I'm here to assassinate the Supreme Court Justice Kavanaugh. I did not like the, uh, this, this desire to possibly overturn Roe v. Wade, and so I came to do what I could to put a stop to it. I will denounce that in the same way that I will denounce someone who says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go plant a bomb at a Planned Parenthood. And I will stand outside of a Planned Parenthood and I will, uh, I will kill doctors. I mean, after all, they're murdering babies. I'm going to murder them. When we try to justify our sinful behavior by coaxing it or, or coding it in, in righteous terms, man, that'll put a lot of zeal inside of you that there is nothing practically that could stop it. Jesus says we're supposed to love our enemies. Now, does that mean that uh, I should just take, I mean, even here, he goes on in the next verse, to him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. Now, this, in context of the day, Jesus was not talking about literal physical altercations. Somebody hits you, go ahead and say, all right, here you go, hit me on that side. He was talking about insults. Getting a backhanded slap was one of the greatest insulting things that could have happened in the day. So he's trying to say, if somebody insults you, just take it. But, but what about when they do these things and they are harming other people? And what if, should I not protect my family then? Should I, should I not uh, be able to stand up? And what about our military personnel who are trying to fight for liberty and, and freedom on behalf of others? Are you saying that those things are wrong? Well, God does call people to stop evil at various times, which is what Romans chapter 13 says the government's job is supposed to be. The government is not supposed to bear the sword in vain, but they are supposed to stand by the truths of God's word and the legal system that has been put in place and uphold civilization. But unfortunately, the political chasm has become greater and greater and greater between a couple of extreme sides. I, I still believe that most people, even in the United States of America, are somewhere kind of in the middle when it comes to politics and the way things should be. I think most people probably agree on things, but the news media and everything, because, you know, uh, tragedy sells, excitement, uh, bloodshed. If it bleeds, it leads. I mean, that's been the, the thing of news media for uh, how many decades or centuries now? And so trying to convince everybody that it, you're all evil and you all hate each other. Stoke up the hatred even more. And Jesus is saying this in the midst of a Roman occupation in Judea. Love your enemies. <laughs> Pray for those who spitefully use you. They hate your name. They hate Christianity. They hate everything it stands for. They hate that you stand up against some of the things that the culture war is trying to push forward in the midst of Pride Month. And they would love it. Many people would love it. If religion would just die and go away that would solve all the problems everybody knows that religion is what creates all these problems except if you do a little jot through history you'll see that the people that actually have committed more mass murder and more atrocities and genocide they were avowed anti-god people joseph stalin pol pot <laughs> they they were not Oh, I'm doing this on the name of Jesus Christ. No, they were not. 
people that are doing evil things around the world today, they might try to justify it in the name of religion, but they're doing it for their own selfish desires. So Jesus is saying to these guys in the midst of the Roman occupation, these, these Roman soldiers walking around that hated the Jews because they were just a, man, they would stir up all kinds of trouble and would be a thorn in their side and be bitter if you all would just kind of go away. And I mean, even Peter, we see him several times. All right, Jesus, I got my sword out. Let's go. Let's get rid of the Romans. This is going to be awesome. We'll put you in as the king. We'll rule and reign. We're going to be good, righteous people. Jesus said, Peter, put your sword away. I've come to defeat a much greater enemy than this. And you know when the church does what the church does best? When the church is best at... I don't know. I think you get what I'm trying to say. We are at our best when we do what Jesus has called us to do, which is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When we offer the peace, joy, purpose, and transformation that the gospel gives, that the word of God gives as it impacts lives and changes lives, that's when we see real, genuine change. But when, when the church decides, no, you know what we're going to be? We are just going to be a political rally all the time, and we're going to stand against those people that are, that are our enemies, and uh, I'll do some good for some people who hate me, but I'm not going to do good to everyone that hates me. I'm going to be kind of selective with my goodness sharing. Then the world looks at us and says, you are no different. Oh, that's kind of actually even what Jesus said in verse 32. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. It says you want to be like the world and only love people that love you back or hate people that hate you back? That's not what I'm calling you to be, my disciples. Jesus said, I am calling you to something far more radical. And when the world sees that it's not just a game, it's not just a, well, you know what, they probably did that once, but it was probably just kind of lure me in. It's like the fish on a hook. Or I'm sorry, though, the worm on a hook, and they're going to get me, and then they're going to they're gonna get me all hooked in there, and then, oh, now you've snatched me. And sometimes people, we, we, we get frustrated with people's skepticism. That the world has taught them to be skeptical. And if we as the body of Christ want to be different, then we need to be different. We can't just love them and then say, okay, here, I'm going to share the gospel with you, and if you get saved, now you're in. You're in the club, and now I'll love you back. No, when we share the gospel, and then they spit in your face, and then you say, hey, you want to come over to my house for dinner tomorrow night? That's what Jesus is talking about. This is the kind of transformation, the kind of difference that he is calling us to. How many of us are you, Christian brothers and sisters? I ain't there all the time. <laughs> there are times that, man, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I'm walking with him and it's like, okay, you know, I can take it, I can absorb it. And uh, these things that are happening, they're not the most uh, comfortable thing in the world, but I'll just take it. And then there are some times where when people come in and even here in verse, going back another couple of verses now, uh, in verse uh, 29, to him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. The cloak being kind of like the outer jacket that they would wear in a sense. The tunic being the, the kind of like, okay, that's my basic clothing now that I got nothing else to wear. 
So somebody takes one thing from me, I'm supposed to give them something else? I was thinking about this verse a couple of days ago when Brother Glenn was over at our house helping put in the, the trim and the baseboards and things like that, and we were talking, and it was one of those things that we needed a tool, and I was looking for it, and I said, ah, you know, that must have been another one of the tools that got stolen a few months ago now. Just frustrated. You buy stuff, you try to buy quality tools instead of just buying the cheapo stuff, and, and then somebody takes them. It's just such like an, an invasive kind of, you know, somebody broke into the house. Somebody cut the locks out. They, they get in. They, they take your stuff. I don't know, again, what was going through their head, but I've gone through all kinds of things. And, oh, so those people, they're, they're renovating a the house. They're buying all these tools. They must be rich enough. They can replace them. And so I, I deserve these things. Or I'm going to take this stuff and I'm going to sell them. Oh, you just got, and I, I want to find them. I want the cops to find them. I want them to arrest them. I want to get my stuff back. Just these things, it's just the, these natural desires that, that swell up within us because it was an unjust act. It was wrong. It was sinful. I believe I had some righteous indignation for a moment. Now, here's the thing. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. I think I had some righteous indignation for a moment. But if I hold on to that, like a little baby, you coddle it, you take care of it, you nurse it, you make sure it stays nice and healthy, and then it grows into bitterness. And I'm thinking about every single day. Every time I walk through the door of that house, all I can think about is that my saw was sitting right there. And now it's not. not what jesus is calling us to again i'm not leaving my doors unlocked saying hey all right you stole something from me i put a sign up here saying come take everything else now yeah. again people that want to try to misuse this verse and say if somebody takes something from you go ahead and just give them everything else it's about an attitude What matters more to me, that stuff or my relationship with God? And if I am harboring anger and sinful bitterness, and if I'm just letting that control my life, it's pulling me away from God. And I, I know I admitted this, uh, I think it was a couple of months ago now, it was kind of right after some things had been taken, and my first inclination when some guy was riding by, a homeless guy, you know, he, and he did not have the most attractive smell uh, around him and such, and he was asking for some trash bags because his trash bag was stuff that had broken open. My first inclination was no. Somebody just stole a bunch of my stuff. I don't want to help anybody. It's the wrong attitude. Whether it was or wasn't that guy that had done it, my heart had been, had, had been hurt and had been pulled in a, towards the darkness rather than to a place like Jesus Christ. <laughs> but again, these people are my enemies. I, they do all kinds of things to me. You know what the Bible says about us before we came to know Jesus Christ as Savior? He said that we were once God's enemies also. We were separated from him. We hated him. We spitefully used his name. Perhaps that's even somebody's testimony. I've heard so many people that have, that have said things over the years that I, I hated the fact that my parents or my aunt or a spouse, if you were maybe an adult when you came to know Christ and your spouse got saved first, and now it's just this like tension in the house. They were, they were an enemy, and I'm going to come to Jesus, and I'm going to show them how stupid all this stuff is. 
Now, praise God for grandparents, parents, siblings, children, spouses who pray for their unsaved family who are still acting like an enemy of God. And praise God that while we were still enemies, Jesus Christ came and died for us. God has demonstrated his love toward us in that after we became perfect little Christians and after we became perfect people, then Christ died for us. That's not what the Bible says. As God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, while we still missed the mark, while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. And praise God that we can now, we don't have to live under the fruit of darkness anymore. We don't have to live under the fruit of death in our lives. But we can now do and live and have the right attitude and the right demeanor. And and we can have the right disposition and we can have the right actions that flow out from us. Verse 35, but love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return. Your reward will be great. You will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Don't give people everything that they deserve, just like God doesn't give you and me everything that we deserve. God's not calling us to some major uh, or some weird, radical thing that he is not willing to do. He is calling us to radical change and radical difference from the world to be like him. He said, I'm already doing this. Just be like me. Be like the Savior that we claim to follow. Love your enemies. Do good. He is kind to the unthankful and evil. So therefore, be merciful, just like your Father is too. You know, while maybe there are times that we can't do everything that maybe we might want to do, I I can't, I don't have the finances to be able to do this or that. I I don't have the, the time to be able to do this or that. You know what we all have the time and money to be able to do? Be kind. Not be rude. Not be disrespectful. But they're throwing disrespect and rudeness at me. Be different. Be like Jesus. When they brought in the the people that were lying about him, saying that he was was a terrible person, he was an evil blasphemer, they, they couldn't even get their story straight as he was going to the cross. Pilate at one point says, look, they're saying all this stuff. What do you say in return? He said, I, I am he. I, I am the son of God. I am the son of man. He didn't shout back. He didn't call down legions of angels when he was being hung on the cross. When people would walk by, spit at him, torture him, he simply said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. We've seen the fangs come out of some people, and I tell you this, I have actually been praying to that end, that evil would be seen for what evil is in our country. That it would not be hidden behind a veneer of goodness any longer, but that the exact thing, the antichrist behavior would be seen for exactly what it is. That prayer is being answered right now. I think the divide is becoming clear. So Christians, we need to be radically different in our behavior. We need to love our enemies just like Jesus Christ has called us to do. So that way we can make a difference. Because if we're exactly the same, 
if the salt has lost its savor, if the thing that makes it different, the thing that cleanses, the thing that preserves, the salt, if it's gone, what are we going to do then? The reality is the world won't change. But if we as God's people will stay salty, not in the disrespectful kind of salty, <laughs> not salty language, but if we will stay salty in the sense of being like Christ, we can make a change. We will make a difference as we walk with Christ. So where are you at today, Christian? Where does your attitude need to change? Where does your behavior need to change? To be a little saltier like Jesus. To make a difference in this world. Do you know Jesus is your personal Savior? If not, I encourage you to make that decision today. Jesus is offering eternal life. You don't have to be good enough, religious enough, just have to say, yes, Lord, I need you. Please save me. Accept his wonderful free gift, bought and paid for with his own life. Now he offers you eternal life if you would simply believe in his name and his work. If you've got questions about any of these things, or if you'd like to pray that God would help to change your attitude, not somebody else's attitude, not I hope somebody else is listening to this message today, but... Lord, if you would help to change me today, maybe you'd like to pray with someone about that. I encourage you to come forward either during our next song or after church today. Let's take some time and let's pray. Let's bring these burdens to the Lord and say, please, Lord, radically transform us so we can have a radical change happen in our world for your glory. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for how it challenges us to change, how it convicts us, how these timeless truths still, Lord, mean something today. Lord, it's hard to be different. It's easy to be like everyone else. It's easy to allow hate and darkness to fill us and change us to be less like Christ. So Lord, let us walk with your Spirit today. Let us be filled with the Holy Spirit so we can push back against the forces of darkness and be different. Lord, we desire to see our world transformed through your good news, all for your glory. So Lord, change our hearts today so that we can go out of this place and be different in this world this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing. If you'd like to pray, I'll be here at the front. We'd love to pray.